Okay, so there we go. Uh, right, so we were talking about uh, level sets last time, and before that we'd been talking about graphs. Let me just remind you, um, in single variable calculus classes, you can kind of get away with conflating a function with the graph of the function. Because, I mean, pretty much in single variable calculus classes, graphs are the only kind of constructions you use to actually generate pictures to understand functions. So it almost feels like they're the same thing. It's going to be very important in this class not to conflate a function, which remember, a function is, a, is an algebraic thing. It's a trio, right? Domain, target, formula, loosely speaking. Okay? Uh, we don't want to conflate that algebraic object called a function with the geometric thing, namely a picture. And by the way, there's various different kinds of pictures that we use to understand the function, right? So they're different things. So uh, nevertheless, sometimes there are relationships between them. And uh, here's the one that I want to talk about here. Notice uh, if you have a function of two variables, real valued, real valued function, multivariable in the sense that there's two input variables. Um, we can talk first about taking the graph, right? So keep in mind the graph is what you get when you uh, make an equation of this sort where the output values uh, of the function are set equal to a new variable. All right, so there's the graph of the function. And if you combine that graph uh, with... A, uh, with a horizontal plane, uh, the horizontal plane uh, is always going to have an equation like z equals c, right? Um, so if you take this, therefore, horizontal cross-section of the graph, then altogether, you're looking for uh, points that satisfy both of these equations, and if f is equal to z and z is equal to c, well, then f is equal to c, which means, uh, really then, that this cross-section of the graph is a level curve. It's a level set, namely f equals c. Um, so, uh, yeah, so it's kind of interesting that, uh, that these are the same thing, and uh, thus this conclusion. Uh, horizontal cross-sections of graphs are level sets. So let's see an example. Uh, here you go. Um, so uh, let's start with, uh, we're going to look at this function here, f, and notice... The graph of f, uh, let's see here, our original function. Right Here we're taking a graph of f, we're taking f, setting it equal to its values, output values equal to a new variable, z. There's the graph of f. And if I take a cross-section by setting z equal to c, then altogether the cross-section of the graph is uh, function equals z, z equals c, and so therefore, x squared plus y squared equals c. Now we, oh yeah, question. Uh, so, do you mean, as long as the c is inside of the range, we can pick any c, any c we want? Yeah, that's right. Well, in fact, it's not even, it's not even limited to values of c that are, that are, uh, in, that are in the image. Uh, it can be, uh, any value of c, in which case, uh, you know, if it's a, if it's a value of c that's not in the range or in the, not in the image, then both of these would just be empty. Okay. Yeah, it'd be a swing and a miss, uh, but uh, still, still the same. Yeah, totally. All right, so let's again now let's think this through geometrically. The graph. Oh, come on, stylus. The graph is uh, kind of a bowl-like shape. And uh, by the way, I'm mean, where I where I uh, justify referring to this equation, x squared plus y squared equals z, as being a bowl. I am going to give you some uh, justification for that later, um, as in later today. Uh, for the moment, let me just say, I, I hope that seems kind of plausible. You can kind of see kind of a parabolic. It's just kind of reminiscent of parabolas here, uh, and we'll make that precise uh, in, a, in a few minutes. But uh, it's a kind of a parabolic bowl. And then again, a horizontal cross-section. What we have in blue here, this is what horizontal cross-sections look like. And looking for points that are in that intersection, namely on these cross-sections, also on the surface. Um, that's the intersections of these planes with the, with, the, uh, with the bowl graph, and I get these, well, circles. And then on the other hand, you can look at uh, just the level sets by themselves. Just, you know, forget about all this graph, cross sections of graphs business, and just directly say what happens when I set 
this function equal to various constants, right? And again, same function, still this same function here. Just directly setting it equal to constants is kind of the morally equi I mean, you still get the same circles. Oh, uh, whoops, purple. You get the same circles, right? It's just that we set f directly equal to a constant as opposed to setting f equal to z and then setting z equal to the constant. I mean, same upshot, right? Okay? So that's all that's going on here when we say that uh, cross-sections of graphs are level sets. Um, it's what, what, what we see in this example here. Okay, so uh, it can be a useful uh, piece of information. Uh, sometimes you need to draw a graph and you're not sure how to analyze, you know, whatever the, you know, this equation uh, here, you might not uh, know how to deal with directly. Um, and knowing that all of its cross sections are these level sets that are easy to understand can help you get a picture. All right. Okay. So, um, yeah, this is one of my favorite examples coming up here. Uh, and that is to, this helps, I think, to emphasize how important it is to be careful with this, uh, all this business about, well, you know, what kind of a picture am I drawing? Am I looking at a level set? Am I looking at a graph? Uh, what exactly is the nature of the construction that I'm using to make a picture out of a function? Yeah. Um, so uh, what we're going to be doing here uh, is looking at uh, this line. Uh, let's see, hang on a second. I'm going to use purple for the line. So that line right there, here's the equation. All right, no big deal, algebra one. There's the equation of a line in two, two dimensions. Um, what function are we looking at here? I'm going to loosely, sloppily uh, ask what uh, what's the function. The the answer is uh, I don't know what you mean. All right? What function? That's not a function. This is a picture. Right, so when we say what function, what we should say is what function is this a picture of, or more specifically, what function is this which kind of picture of? Right? This is on the one hand a graph, perhaps, of one function, maybe. It might be a level set of a different function. Uh, it might be parameterized by a third function. Right? But there's going to be different functions that we associate to this exact same line. Uh, and uh, we'll talk about how big of a deal this is uh, in just a couple of minutes. But uh, let's, uh, let's get to finding what these functions are. I claim first that this is the graph of, uh, of this function right here. Well, here, let me... Uh, again, functions are trios. So it's the graph of that function I claim. Now I got I owe you a justification. You know, why? How do I know that this is the graph of that function? Well, graph means taking the function and setting it equal to uh, some new variable. Here I'm going to choose y. And notice, having done that, having set the value of the function equal to this new variable y. Sorry, I wanted that in the light green. This is the equation for the graph of that f. And I claim that that's the same as this line. Uh, and there's uh, some algebra to be done there. You do have to uh, show that these equations are algebraically equivalent. And I think that's a pretty easy uh, little calculation. Uh, just to cross multiply by the three move terms around. You'll see it's they're, they're, uh, totally equivalent uh, equations. So the uh, to emphasize again, the graph of this function is this line. So the graph of f is that purple line. How are we doing? Is everybody on board? Okay. Okay. Now, um, maybe uh, on the other hand, though, maybe I want to understand this as being a level set of something. Is this... Uh, oh, I'm sorry. I got ahead of myself. Uh, I... Uh, I kind of um, uh, pulled this out of thin air, right? Let's let's instead of pulling this out of thin air and justifying that it actually worked, let's ask the question: How would I go about finding this form, this function, the function whose graph is this equation? Well, here's the thing: whatever this is, whatever this thing is, it has to be such that 
uh, let's see here, I wanted a uh, pencil. This has to be the thing that when I set it equal to y, gives me something equivalent to that equation. And I argue that what that means is I'm effectively solving for this y. If I solve for y in this equation, that I would have the thing which when set equal to y is this equation. I, I, that's kind of a grammatical nothingness. I hope that makes sense. <laughs> right? But to solve for y in this equation that gives you this, setting that thing equal to y then gives you exactly the same equation. So that's the, that's the process. You just solve for y. Okay. All right. Next. I claim that this is a level set. Let me uh, switch to, yeah, so we're looking here. This line is a level set of this function. Now, again, I have to justify that. How do I know that this is a level set of that function? Well, keep in mind, level set means you're going to set this equal to a constant. Right? So level set means that. And I assert that this equation here, in <coughs> circled in light blue, uh, that equation for some appropriate value of c is equivalent to this equation. And well, uh, yeah, of course it is. It's c equals 6, right? That, that one, sometimes the fish jump on the boat. Uh, we, there was nothing to be done. I needed to rewrite this algebra so that it was stuff equals constant. And it was already stuff equals constant. So nothing to it. It's in some sense already written as a level set. Okay. All right. Now, before I... Uh, well, you know what, okay, sure, let's go ahead and do the last one. Uh, last assertion I make, uh, this line, same line I emphasize, same picture. There is a third function that I can think of as, in a way, representing this line, uh, and that is uh, this one here, in the sense that this parametrizes the line. Now, in order to see that this works, uh, I'm going to rewrite this as... Uh, uh, let's see here, uh, 0, 2 plus t times 3, negative 2. Now that's just sort of a little bit of vector algebra there. And then you notice that uh, this 0, comma 2 is that point right there. And this uh, yellow, I guess. This vector there, that's our direction vector, is that difference vector right there. So this parameterization parameterizes that line. How are we doing on that? Okay. Okay, so why do we care? What's the big deal? Why, you know, Kat? Aren't I kind of getting, um, you know, much ado about nothing here? Does this really matter? Let me explain why this matters. Um, we are eventually, very soon actually, part, uh, starting kind of today, uh, going to start learning what I'm going to call different kinds of calculus. And calculus, as you know, um, uh, is uh, there's a sort of algebraic side of it, but there's also the geometric side of it, right? There's You can take derivatives, you can do chain rule, quotient rule, what have you. But then there's geometric interpretations such as, what does it look like on the picture? Well, it's the you know, single variable calculus, it's the slope of the tangent line. Be fair, it's the slope of the tangent line to the graph specifically of the function, right? um, and then uh, you know second derivatives are uh, concavity or something, and uh, you know there's all sorts of various geometric interpretations. So the geometric interpretations of calculus depend on what kind of geometric picture are you looking at, right? So we're going to have several different kinds of calculus. Uh, loosely speaking, we're going to have the calculus of graphs. We're going to have a calculus of level sets, and we're going to have a calculus of parametric curves, and they're all going to look different. So, um, if you're going to try to uh, understand this line, you know, maybe you want to understand, uh, about, anyway, whatever geometrically you might want to understand about this line, if what you want to do is apply one of the, you know, facts that we're going to establish about the calculus of graphs, you'd better use the function whose graph is the line you actually care about. If you apply the calculus of graphs to this function and think it's going to apply to that line, no, it's not. 
<laughs> it won't make any sense at all, and it certainly won't be right. Right? So you have to know, and you have to be crystal clear in your mind, what kind of a picture am I looking at? What's the relationship? What construction is the relationship between the picture I'm interested in and the function that I'm going to be doing algebra with in order to be able to choose uh, what, uh, what kind of calculus to apply? Does that make sense to everybody? I hope that makes sense. Quick, uh, quick example. Uh, if you wanted to find, for example, the slope of this line. How do you find the slope of the line? Well, you would apply the calculus of graphs. We know single variable calculus, in fact. That tells us that uh, the derivative of a function gives you the slope of the graph of that function. So the calculus of graphs applied to this function, yep, tells us what we want. But if you just take the derivative <laughs> of this function, whatever that means, by the way, we don't even have a notion of a derivative of a multivariable function yet. But the, even if we were, and we will momentarily later today, uh, uh, have a, a, a way to take a derivative of this, still, those derivatives immediately interpreted will not have anything to do with uh, with the uh, slope that we're looking for. So you got to use the right kind of calculus. Namely, you have to apply uh, whatever derivatives you're going to use to the right function among the several that you might have to choose from. Okay. All right. That's what this uh, this discussion here is all about. Okay. Neat trick uh, that allows you to kind of switch between uh, these different points of view. Uh, I'm going to start by looking at this algebra right here and observe that very little happened in that algebra. All right, we've got this equation here, and all I did is I took, the, in some sense, the right-hand side, and I just kind of, you know, tossed it over here to the left-hand side with a minus sign, you know, the basic uh, in algebra one. No big deal. Hardly anything happened there. Very useful algebra, though, and as follows. This first equation that we have written here, that first equation, notice, we are interpreting that as being a graph of a function. Right? Graph, again, keep in mind, means you're taking some function, setting its value is equal to a new variable. So this is, a, as written, this is a graph of this function here called f. And let me uh, circle this thing just to be clear. We are looking at a graph of that function f. Okay. Now, on the other hand, let's look down here. Down here, uh, this uh, this equation down here, we are looking, you can see right here, we're looking at a level set. We have set something equal to a constant. That means we are looking at a level set of something. In particular, we are looking at a level set, well, of this function right there. Notice this thing that we have set equal to a constant. Therefore, this thing whose level set this equation describes, this thing is not f. It's very important. It's not. It's y minus f right there in front of us. Right? So, um, so that means that if, if, hypothetically, you're looking at a graph of one function, you can choose, if it might be convenient, to also instead view it as a level set of a different function just by doing this one little, very easy little bit of algebra right here. It rewrites something thought of as a graph as something thought of as a level set. Now, uh, why would this, why would you ever have any use for this? Who cares? What's this good for? Um, sometimes a question might say, hey, here's a function. We're interested in the graph of the function. I want to learn something about the graph. The graph of the function is going to be some kind of a surface, maybe. I want to study this surface. And it's given to me as a graph. Maybe, though, the thing that I want to know about that surface, oh, man, i uh, tell you what, the calculus of level sets would give me exactly what I'm looking for. But, again, you're not asked about a level set. You've been asked about a graph, specifically the graph of this function. So the idea here is that if you're asked about a graph, or for whatever reason you have a graph, you can rewrite it. Same thing now, I haven't really done anything, but you can reinterpret it as being a level set of a different 
function, and this is how you find that different function. And you can apply the calculus of level sets to this function, and therefore infer something about the graph of this other function. Yeah, I saw a hand back there. Yeah. Um, can you explain like level sets? I don't, uh, what do you mean? Like level, what is level set? Uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Okay, so that's from last time. Uh, level set. Let me just go back there real quick. Uh, a uh, level set. Uh, yeah, um, a level set is well. It's most succinctly, it's a preimage. Uh, but the way you think about this is a level set is what you get when you take your function and you set it equal to a constant. And uh, I wrote this constant as a vector here just to, just to be general, but the vast majority of the time we're looking at real value functions, so this is just some number. Yeah, so a level set is what you get when you set your function equal to a constant. Yeah, is that cool? Yeah. Yeah. Right. Okay. <clears throat> yeah. Okay, let me show you an example of this in action. Uh, same exact thing that I'm doing here in general. I'm just going to do it in specific here. So um, suppose I'm interested in this equation here. This is what I want to understand. Maybe I just want to know what this thing looks like. Or maybe I need to know something, uh, so, you know, something specific about that surface. Again, reminder, we will eventually learn some calculus of graphs. We will also eventually learn some calculus of level sets. And uh, it's going to take us some time to do all that stuff. But, again, imagine that, oh, man, this thing that I want to know about this surface, oh, if, if only I could view this as being a level set, because the calculus of level sets would crush this. And that's going to happen, by the way. That's, a, that's for sure going to be a thing. Uh, it's not given as a level set. It's given as a graph. It's clearly a graph of... This function. Can I reinterpret this graph as a level set? Well, you'll notice I'm just going to do this same move that we did above. I'm just going to kind of move everything over to one side. Hardly anything happened, right? I'm going to get then the exact same equation. This is morally identical. These are the, uh, they're what we call equivalent equations. Any point that satisfies one satisfies the other. They're exactly the same surface. Um, this one, though, interpreted, you see here, as a level set. It's a level set of that function right there. So you can go ahead and apply the calculus of level sets to this function. After all, you are looking at a level set of this function. And anything that you learn about the calculus of level sets of, of, as applied to this function applies to this graph because they are the same surface. Okay. All right, so it's a good little trick. Uh, let's see. Oh, yeah. Um, yes? So if we say that g, like inverse of 0 equals that equation, are we assuming that all these functions are invertible? No, this, this is a sloppy but very handy notation that says... Uh, you know, uh, this is all all values of uh, all ordered pairs x and y such that g of x y is equal to zero. So, I mean, if the function were invertible, <laughs> then this would be literally what it says: g inverse of zero. Um, when the function's not invertible, then you remember we had this. We were observing there might be multiple preimages. Yeah. G inverse means okay. Let's talk about the set of all of those preimages. Yeah, yeah. So it's a it's a sloppy. It makes it look like there's a function. This is this g inverse. What I've written as g inverse is not a function. Um, so that's that's sloppy. But it's also extremely standard and extremely convenient because it conjures the right image. Right. We're going to take zero on the right, and we're going to try to go back to the left to see what inputs would have given that output. It's as if we're inverting. It's just that we get a set instead of a point. Yeah. Great question. Anybody else? All right. Um, yeah. So whenever you have a graph, you can interpret it as a level set. Sweet. Sadly, not so the other way around. Not every level set is a graph. And it's just, I mean, easy to see a counterexample. Here's a level set. That's a level set. Um, right? It's a level set because something's been set equal to a constant. Uh, specifically, it's a level set of this function right there. Is it a graph? 
Can I uh, can I say can I solve for why? It depends on what you mean by the word solve. Uh, to be clear, when I say solve here, I mean can you find a formula that always gives the unique corresponding value of y? And no, because there is no unique value of y. For any given x, there's two possible values for y. So you can't solve because there is no single thing to solve for. So so not, not solve in the sense of find all possible solutions, but solve in the sense of finding an unambiguous, unique solution. Okay. All right. Okay, so not every level set is a graph, and that's um, too bad. All right. Okay. Uh, next up is a another little neat fact of algebra uh, in the uh, in the category of questions of uh, we got some equation, uh, multivariable equation, got x, y's, and z's, or you know, uh, wh whatever. Some equation is let's say three variables. What does that thing look like? What is the, how do I how do I draw a surface? Right. That uh, is an equation of three variables. Uh, and this is one of my favorite little tricks. Um, neat, uh, neat fact. If your equation involves x's and y's only, only as part of this expression, and then you can, you're allowed to do other things too that you can take this expression and square it. You can take this expression and take its exponential or you know, whatever, right? But if x and y only show up as part of this expression, uh, then uh, your equation represents a surface that's rotationally symmetric around the z-axis. And so what I, what I think is neat about this is the condition here, x and y appearing only as related to this form, eyeball, easy to check. You just look at it. Just, where's my x's and y's? Are they all part of something that looks like this? Easy to check the condition. The conclusion, super powerful. Very strong piece of information about the thing you're trying to, to understand. It's rotationally symmetric around the z-axis. That's a huge amount of information. All right, now let me try to persuade you that this is true. Um, <clears throat> so, um, yeah, uh, let's, uh, let's think about a point here that's on our surface. So this point satisfies um, our... Uh, satisfies our equation. Let's think about what would happen if I were to rotate that point around. Um, yeah, I'm going to rotate around like that to give me now this point. And what can I say about that point? Obviously, it has different x and y coordinates. right? I mean, I rotate it around this. Yeah, x changes, y changes. It's all The x and y are all different. However, you will notice because I'm rotating around the z-axis, the z-coordinate didn't change at all. Also, because I'm rotating around the z-axis, this distance to the z-axis also didn't change at all. all. Right. So these two points, yeah, 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 different points, totally, yeah, fine. They have the same z, they have the same r. And if you think about it, that's what this is. This thing right here is r. So if x and y don't participate in the equation in any other way other than to compute the r that these two points agree on anyway, <laughs> right? then the algebra of the equation is just going to go through. The algebra of the equation only involves square root of x squared plus y squared and z. That's all that's in the equation. These two points agree for those, and therefore they agree for the equation. And so if that purple point is a solution, then this orange point also a solution. And uh, therefore, our, our surface is rotationally symmetric. So neat fact. Here's an alternative point of view on that if you don't like that one. Uh, and that is uh, to realize that uh, this such an equation in cylindrical has no thetas. If you think about it, where do thetas come from? Right? Um, X has thetas in it. Y has thetas in it. So generally speaking, wherever you have X's and Y's, you have thetas. But 
if x and y only show up in this form where the Pythagorean identity kicks in and, and the thetas disappear, then there are no thetas to be to have come from anywhere else. So no thetas, and we've talked last time or well, last week, at some point, uh, we talked about how if the equation has no thetas, then it's rotationally symmetric. Yeah. Um, so would this work with different powers? Is that yeah. plus y cube? No, sadly not. Because so the the point is we need for this uh, to to relate to distance, right? Because distance is what's preserved when you rotate around the z-axis. Uh, so distance is very very specifically x squared y squared, right? Um, at, well, square root. But uh, yeah. So only because of the Pythagorean That's right. That's right. It's, it's, or you might say it's because of the distance formula. Take your pick. Same, morally equivalent. But yeah. Okay. Yep. Yep. Good question. Okay. Okay. So let's see a uh, let's see an example of this. Um, here's that surface we were looking at previously. I claimed it was kind of a parabolic bowl. I uh, didn't justify that, but we're, now we're going to justify it. So step one: x and y only appear there, which I can rewrite, by the way, if you'd like, I can rewrite this as square root of x squared plus y squared squared, right? So um, rewriting is fine, right? But notice x and y up here only can be viewed as showing up only as part of this special form. There are no other extraneous x's or uh, you know unconnected y's or anything like that. So this surface is rotationally symmetric around the z-axis. And again, I claim this is huge information. We'll see why momentarily. Okay, rotationally symmetric. Uh, and again, uh, z-axis. Okay. Now here's the thing. Um, if you know your surface is rotationally symmetric around the z-axis, you could just try to understand this cross section, let's say, this cross section in the in the YZ plane, and if you know it's rotationally symmetric, whatever that cross section is, uh, you're just going to rotate that around the Z axis, and boom, you're there. Because if it's rotationally symmetric, this alone, any any cross section containing the axis, is enough information to just rotate it around and conclude what the surface is. So let's look then at this cross section, x equals zero, of this surface, and I'm going to plug in here uh, because x equals zero. You can plug that right in in this cross section. Plug that right into there, and what's left is just z equals y squared, which is uh, old news. All right, that's a parabola, hundred percent. Old. I mean, just we all have known this is a parabola since what middle school? It's uh, you know. Established, so that's a parabola. I can draw it very easily. It's this right here. So uh, there's that. Now, reminder: uh, what's our big strategy here? Our big strategy is to take advantage of the fact that this is rotationally symmetric by understanding a cross section. And if it's rotationally symmetric, I just rotate that cross section then around the z-axis. And I appeal to your your uh, sense of geometry. If you rotate. Uh, let's see here. If you rotate around, let's see, symmetric around the z. If you rotate around the z-axis, uh, you're going to get. Well, you're going to get this bowl. How we doing? Everybody on board? Side note: This is called a paraboloid. Um, good thing to know. So uh, yeah, I'd say two things about this. Make sure to understand this argument, but also <laughs> paraboloids come up a lot. So also make sure to re just just remember, memorize that this equation is a parabola. Okay, another example. Uh, what's um, what's this thing here? Okay, well, uh, x and y appear only in the special form, so this is rotationally symmetric around the z-axis. Whatever this thing is, rotationally symmetric around the z-axis. Um, pick any, again, any cross-section plane that you want. That Now, it does have to contain the axis. It's no good to, you can't look in the x-y plane here. That doesn't contain the axis. Um, 
I mean, think geometrically, if I knew what the cross section was down here, it's just rotating that doesn't give me any information about what's going on way up here. Right? So you need your plane in question to actually contain the axis. So this time, just to be different, I'm going to take y equals zero. Pick any plane you want. Um, okay, so picking y equals zero, fine. Uh, to understand what happens there then, this becomes zero. I'm left with x squared minus z squared equals one. Again, old news, right? High school algebra. That's one of those annoying, you gotta remember which way this, which way does the hyperbola open up, right? And it's easy to get that reverse. So, so br uh, brush up, make sure you're good with your algebra. Uh, but, uh, this is, uh, one of these hyperbolas. So I know my surface is symmetric, rotationally symmetric. I know what one of the relevant cross sections look like. And so now just imagine taking that hyperbola and spinning it around the z-axis and that generates your surface, which looks uh, something kind of like this. Um, and this is called a hyperboloid of one sheet. What do you think? Yes? Um, would that like x squared Minus z squared one mm -hmm. be like a, a level set? Like yeah, this, uh, I hear where you're coming from, right? Level sets, you can kind of think, well, we know level sets are cross sections of graphs, right? But they are in particular horizontal cross sections of graphs. And this, first of all, is not a graph, for one thing, right? And then furthermore, the cross section we took is not horizontal. Yeah, so, so it's got some of the same earmarks, but uh, yeah, this is not, uh, it, uh, this isn't a level set of anything uh, that we particularly care about in this question. Does that make sense? Yeah, 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 yeah. But it's a natural instinct. Um, yeah, totally. Anybody else? Mm -hmm. Sorry, um, I'm just wondering like, how we're defining a graph again. Yeah, okay, right. So a graph is, uh, let's see here. Uh, yeah, right. So the graph is uh, where you take the values of the function, which are gonna, uh, well, anyway, the values of the function, you set those equal to a new variable, right, maybe y, uh, something like that, and uh, you put the inputs and the outputs uh, all uh, into the same uh, sort of ordered n plus m tuple in this case. You, you make them all uh, 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 coordinates and uh, then plot the resulting equation. Effectively, you're plotting the all of the solutions to this equation. So you're all together, you're taking the output values of the function and setting them equal to new variables and plotting. Is that cool? Yeah. And uh, yeah, some examples uh, down here. Yeah. Okay. Okay. All right. Let's uh, let's see one more example. In this next example, I'm going to appeal to your sense of uh, um, uh, pattern, and that is um, if you uh, have a, a similar algebraic arrangement here, y and z, not x and y, but y and z appear only in the special form. And wouldn't it seem plausible that this would give you a rotational symmetry around the x-axis? Wouldn't you think? Now, uh, I think this is a fantastic little exercise to, to think through uh, carefully. Uh, roughly speaking, you're going to copycat what's in uh, this argument right here. Here, uh, because we're looking at x and y appearing in this special form, this special form being distance from the z-axis, it's because that's distance from the z-axis that we get a rotational symmetry around the z-axis, right? Now, just do the same thing, except instead of thinking about x's and y's and distance from the z-axis, think about y's and z's and distance from the x-axis. The picture will look different, but you'll end up with arguing that there is a rotational symmetry around the x-axis. So good exercise. I want everyone to think that through uh, for yourselves. Uh, we'll apply the uh, the result that I'm suggesting here and infer that we do indeed have rotational symmetry around the x-axis. There's the x-axis. 
And now let's see here. Um, hmm, what 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 else am I going to do? I uh, need to understand what uh, what is being rotated. So I'm going to pick a plane. Again, any plane you want that contains the axis of rotation. If you wanted to pick the vertical, the XZ plane, eh, it'll work too. Go ahead, it's fine. Um, no particular reason. I'm going to do this one, which of course is Z equals zero. And when you've decided that z is equal to zero, that makes this term go away. Uh, we end up then with our cross-section curve having this equation. Again, old news, that's a, that's a hyperbola. Uh, think through which way it goes. It's kind of like this. There's a hyperbola. That's what the cross-section looks like in that plane. That's the thing that you therefore rotate around the x-axis. And now you, again, geometry, intuition, what happens when you rotate this around the x-axis? Uh, you're gonna get a couple of, a uh, couple of sort of round things like this. Uh, everybody will come up with a different metaphor for what this is. To me, this kind of makes me think of like a, like there's a sort of a, sort of like a, a contact lens back there and another contact lens back here. So this is what I like to call the staring contest. I don't know if y'all, it's, it's silly, but uh, it's like two eyeballs that are looking right at each other. Anyway, that's uh, one way you might think of that. Uh, but uh, the common terminology for that is hyperboloid of two sheets. Notice, this is a rotation of a hyperbola, thus the term hyperboloid. But then again, so is this one. This is a different kind of, different a rotation in a different direction of a hyperbola. And so um, also a hyperboloid, but this one only has one chunk. Uh, this one has two chunks, and so thus the, thus the name. Okay, everybody good? All right. Okay, deformations. Um, sometimes the surface that you have is a slight tweak of a surface that you already understand. And sometimes that's a really useful observation. So for example, let's look at this equation right here. We already understand that equation. This, uh, this is talking about distance away from the origin. The distance away from the origin is 13. That's a sphere. No problem. Sphere of uh, radius 13. There you go. Understand that completely. But suppose the surface that you're actually interested in has this equation. Now, this is not distance from the origin. So this is not a sphere. And uh, I guess I could make a rotation argument, but let's, uh, let's uh, uh, not do that. I want to talk about a different method here. Um, what I want to do is take advantage of the fact that I can view the blue surface as being the result of doing a simple adjustment, a simple deformation uh, of the green surface. Namely, everywhere I have a Z, I replace it with 2Z. All right, be careful with your parentheses. Right. So uh, what I want to ask then is, well, I understand, I understand the green surface. This little move, this little tweak, this purple tweak, Algebraically, that turns my green equation into my blue equation. Geometrically, what does that do? What, what geometrically happens with this purple adjustment? And uh, if I understand geometrically what it does, then I can just say, oh, well, let's perform that geometric process to this sphere. And we have an answer. So that's the big question. Um, here's how I'm going to get my, uh, my foot in the door on that uh, notice. This point here, 3, 4, 12, works in that equation. It's Pythagorean quadruple, they call it. Uh, so I'll plug those numbers in. Uh, arithmetic works great. Now, however, if you take that point and plug it in over to here, it doesn't work. Of course it doesn't work. It's a different equation. I messed it all up when I put that 2 in there. This point doesn't work because uh, the 12 here was supposed to be the thing that got squared, 
But by putting that 2 in there, 12, z being 12, it doesn't get squared. That z gets multiplied by 2 first, and I end up squaring 24, and everything just crashes and burns. Right? So the arithmetic doesn't work for that reason. So the clever observation, though, is to realize that, okay, well, yeah, but if I were to put in 6 for z instead of 12... Then the 6 goes there, you multiply by 2, and I get 12 that's squared, just like the arithmetic that already worked over here. So um, whenever you stick in an extra 2, like that, algebraically, um, in some sense, every point that was on this surface, if you just divide the z-coordinate by 2, then that's going to kind of adjust for the 2 that you put in there, and that'll work on this surface. So punchline then, um, this process of this process of algebraically replacing all the z's with two z's, what it does is it squishes geometrically. I'll, I'll do this in purple also. Uh, it squishes by a factor of two in the uh, in the z direction. So there you go. Um, you might say that what happens to the surface is in some sense the exact opposite of what we did in the algebra. We put an extra factor of 2 in the algebra, and so therefore we in some sense have to squish by a factor of 2 geometrically. Um, so, uh, yeah, this is a pretty good general rule of thumb. Uh, whatever you do to the variable in the equation, the opposite happens to the surface. Okay, so here's a... Another example, um, how would I understand this equation here, this blue equation over here on the right? And, oh, gosh, well, that's not distance. It's not rotationally symmetric uh, around any axes because of the a, b's, and c's kind of mess up. I mean, none of, the, none of the pairs of squares show up in the right form. It's just that it just doesn't, right? Okay, but what I can say is I do already understand that. That's easy. This is this unit sphere. No problem. Old, old familiar thing. Um, everywhere I have an x in this equation, it's like I'm replacing it with x over a. And now let's think about what is the opposite of dividing by a. The opposite of dividing by a is to multiply by a. So all of the x coordinates get multiplied by a. We stretch in the in the x direction by a factor of a. And then uh, likewise, uh, the uh, the y gets replaced with y over b, right? Consistently throughout the whole equation, and that stretches by a factor of b in the y direction. And then likewise, we stretch by a factor of c in the z direction. So uh, so the, the thing that we're trying to understand, this equation we're trying to understand, uh, what it is, is it's a sphere that's been stretched by various different uh, factors in various different directions. And I think that's uh, pretty, pretty easy to see. All those cross sections are going to be ellipses. And this is what we call an ellipsoid. Everybody good? couple other easy, quick examples. Um, we already know this is a paraboloid. Um, to get this equation on the right, I'm just replacing x with x over a. Do be careful with parentheses and squares, right? x gets replaced with x over a because this is, uh, let me squeeze this in here. This is uh, this term, oh gosh, uh, this term is x over a quantity squared, right? So x is being replaced with x over a. A lot of students will mess that up and say x over a squared, which is wrong. And um, uh, likewise, y is getting replaced with y over b. And so this paraboloid with circular cross sections just gets stretched in the x and y directions, and this now has elliptical cross sections, and thus the name uh, this is an elliptical paraboloid. Uh, and likewise, you can see the same thing happening here. 
right? This is an elliptical uh, hyperboloid of two sheets. There we go. Okay. Everybody good? Okay. Okay, so that's a pretty good stopping point. Uh, we are out of time. Uh, so we are just done with section 2.1. Uh, real quick, I'll call to your attention, there is no 2.2 in the notes. 2.2 is also not on the course content syllabus. Uh, so uh, we're just skipping 2.2. Sadly, we just don't have time. Um, not really necessary anyway. Uh, but uh, anyway, starting with 2.3 on Wednesday. Y'all have a good one. Oh, and last reminder, if you came in after I did attendance, make sure to let me know so I can check. I'm happy to mark you down, but you do have to come and note your.